Blagderas by Lord Dunsany. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, in January 2018. On a waste place strewn with bricks in the outskirts of a town, twilight was falling. A star or two appeared over the smoke, and distant windows lit mysterious lights. The stillness deepened, and the loneliness. Then all the outcast things that are silent by day found voices. An old cork spoke first. He said, I grew in Andalusian woods, but never listened to the idle songs of Spain. I only grew strong in the sunlight, waiting for my destiny. One day the merchants came and took us all away, and carried us all along the shore of the sea, piled high on the backs of donkeys, and in a town by the sea they made me into the shape that I am now. One day they sent me northward to Provence, and there I fulfilled my destiny, for they set me as a guard over the bubbling wine, and I faithfully stood sentinel for twenty years. For the first few years in the bottle that I guarded, the wine slept, dreaming of Provence. But as the years went on, he grew stronger and stronger, until at last, whenever a man went by, the wine would put out all his might against me, saying, Let me go free, let me go free. And every year his strength increased, and he grew more clamorous when men went by, but never availed to hurl me from my post. But when I had powerfully held him for twenty years, they brought him to the banquet and took me from my post. And the wine arose rejoicing and leapt through the veins of men and exalted their souls within them till they stood up in their places and sang Provencal songs. But me they cast away, me that had been sentinel for twenty years and was still as strong and staunch as when first I went on guard. Now I am an outcast in a cold northern city who once had known the Andalusian skies and guarded long ago Provencal sons that swam in the heart of the rejoicing wine. An unstruck match that somebody had dropped spoke next. I am a child of the sun, he said, and an enemy of cities. There is more in my heart than you know of. I am a brother of Etna and Stromboli. I have fires lurking in me that will one day rise up beautiful and strong. We will not go into servitude on any hearth, nor work machines for our food. But we will take our own food where we find it on that day when we are strong. There are wonderful children in my heart whose faces shall be more lively than the rainbow. They shall make a compact with the north wind, and he shall lead them forth. All shall be black behind them, and black above them, and there shall be nothing beautiful in the world but them. They shall seize upon the earth, and it shall be theirs, and nothing shall stop them but our old enemy, the sea. Then an old broken kettle spoke, and said, I am the friend of cities. I sit among the slaves upon the hearth the little flames that have been fed with coal. When the slaves dance behind the iron grate, I sit in the middle of the dance and sing and make our masters glad. And I make songs about the comfort of the cat and about the malice that is towards her in the heart of the dog and about the crawling of the baby and about the ease that is in the lord of the house when we brew the good brown tea. And sometimes, when the house is very warm, and slaves and masters are glad, I rebuke the hostile winds that prowl about the world. And then there spoke a piece of an old chord. I was made in a place of doom, and doomed men made my fibers, working without hope. Therefore there came a grimness into my heart, so that I never let anything go free when once I was set to bind it. 
many a thing have i bound relentlessly for months and years for i used to come coiling into warehouses where the great boxes lay all open to the air and one of them would be suddenly closed up and my fearful strength would be set on him like a curse and if his timbers groaned when first i seized them or if they creaked aloud in the lonely night thinking of woodlands out of which they came then i only gripped them tighter still for a poor useless hate is in my soul of those that made me in the place of doom yet for all the things that my prison clutch has held the last work that i did was to set something free i lay idle one night in the gloom on the warehouse floor nothing stirred there and even the spider slept towards midnight a great flock of echoes suddenly leapt up from the wooden planks and circled round the roof a man was coming towards me all alone and as he came his soul was reproaching him and i saw that there was a great trouble between the man and his soul for his soul would not let him be but went on reproaching him then the man saw me and said this at least will not fail me when i heard him say this about me i determined that whatever he might require of me it should be done to the uttermost and as i made this determination in my unfaltering heart he picked me up and stood on an empty box that i should have bound on the morrow and tied one end of me to a dark rafter and the knot was carelessly tied because his soul was reproaching him all the while continually and giving him no ease then he made the other end of me into a noose and when the man's soul saw this it stopped reproaching the man and cried out to him hurriedly and besought him to be at peace with it and to do nothing sudden but the man went on with his work and put the noose down over his face and underneath his chin and the soul screamed horribly then the man kicked the box away with his foot and the moment he did this i knew that my strength was not great enough to hold him but i remembered that he had said i would not fail him and i put all my grim vigor into my fibres and held by sheer will then the soul shouted to me to give way but i said no you vexed the man then it screamed for me to leave go over the rafter and already i was slipping for i only held on to it by a careless knot but i gripped with my prison grip and said you vexed the man and very swiftly it said other things to me but i answered not and at last the soul that vexed the man that trusted me flew away and left him at peace I was never able to bind things any more, for every one of my fibres was worn and wretched, and even my relentless heart was weakened by the struggle. Very soon afterwards I was thrown out here. I have done my work. So the outcast things spoke among themselves, but all the while there loomed above them the form of an old rocking horse complaining bitterly. He said, I am Blagda Ross, woe is me that i should lie now an outcast among these worthy but little people alas for the days that are gathered and alas for the great one that was a master and a soul to me whose spirit is now shrunken and can never know me again and no more ride abroad on nightly quests i was bucephalus when he was alexander and carried him victorious as far as india i encountered dragons with him when he was st george i was the horse of roland fighting for christendom and was often rosinant i fought in tourneys and went errant upon quests and met ulysses and the heroes and the fairies or late in the evening just before the lamps in the nursery were put out he would suddenly mount me and we would gallop through africa there we would pass by night through tropic forests and come upon dark rivers sweeping by all gleaming with the eyes of crocodiles where the hippopotamus floated down with the stream and mysterious craft loomed suddenly out of the dark and furtively passed away 
and when we had passed through the forest lit by the fireflies we would come to the open plains and gallop onwards with scarlet flamingos flying along beside us through the lands of dusky kings with golden crowns upon their heads and sceptres in their hands who came running out of their palaces to see us pass then i would wheel suddenly and the dust flew up from my four hooves as i turned and we galloped home again and my master was put to bed and again he would ride abroad on another day till we came to magical fortresses guarded by wizardry and overthrew the dragons at the gate and ever came back with a princess fairer than the sea but my master began to grow larger in his body and smaller in his soul and then he rode more seldom upon quests at last he saw gold and never came again and i was cast out here among these little people but while the rocking horse was speaking two boys stole away unnoticed by their parents from a house on the edge of the waste place and were coming across it looking for adventures one of them carried a broom and when he saw the rocking horse he said nothing but broke off the handle from the broom and thrust it between his braces and his shirt on the left side then he mounted the rocking horse and drawing forth the broomstick which was sharp and spiky at the end said saladin is in this desert with all his paynims and i am cour de lion after a while the other boy said now let me kill saladin too but Blagdoros, in his wooden heart that exulted with thoughts of battle, said, I am Blagdoros yet. This ends Blagdoros by Lord Dinsany. Cupid a la carte by O. Henry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Cupid a la carte from Heart of the West by O. Henry. The dispositions of woman, said Jack Peters, after various opinions on the subject had been advanced, run regular to diversions. What a woman wants is what you're out of. She wants more of a thing when it's scarce she likes to have souvenirs of things that never happened she likes to be reminded of things she never heard of a one-sided view of objects is disjointing to the female composition tis a misfortune of mine begotten by nature and travel continued jeff looking thoughtfully between his elevated feet at the grocery stove to look deeper into some subjects than most people do i've breathed gasoline smoke talking to street crowds in nearly every town in the united states i've held em spellbound with music oratory sleight of hand and prevarications while i've sold them jewelry medicine soap hair tonic and junk of other nominations and during my travels as a matter of recreation and expiation i've taken cognizance some of women it takes a man a lifetime to find out about one particular woman but if he puts in say ten years industrious and curious he can acquire the general rudiments of the sex one lesson i picked up was when i was working the west with a line of brazilian diamonds and a patent fire kindler just after my trip from savannah down through the cotton belt with dalby's anti-explosive lamp oil powder twas when the oklahoma country was in first bloom guthrie was rising in the middle of it like a lump of self-raising dough it was a boom town of the regular kind you stood in line to get a chance to wash your face if you ate over ten minutes you had a lodging bill added on if you slept on a plank at night they charged it to you as board the next morning by nature and doctrines i am addicted to the habit of discovering choice places wherein to feed so i looked around and found a proposition that exactly cut the mustard i found a restaurant tent just opened up by an outfit that had drifted in on the tail of the boom they had knocked together a box house 
where they lived and did the cooking and served the meals in a tent pitched against the side that tent was joyful with placards on it calculated to redeem the world-worn pilgrim from the sinfulness of boarding-houses and pick-me-up hotels try mother's homemade biscuits what's the matter with our apple dumplings and hard sauce hot cakes and maple syrup like you ate when a boy our fried chicken never was heard to crow there was literature doomed to please the digestions of a man i said to myself that mother's wandering boy should munch there that night and so it came to pass and there is where i contracted my case of mame dugan old man dugan was six feet by one of indiana loafer and he spent his time sitting on his shoulder blades in a rocking chair in the shanty memorializing the great corn crop failure of ninety six ma dugan did the cooking and mame waited on the table as soon as i saw mame i knew there was a mistake in the census reports there wasn't but one girl in the united states when you come to specifications it isn't easy she was about the size of an angel and she had eyes and ways about her when you come to the kind of a girl she was you'll find a belt of them reaching from the brooklyn bridge west as far as the courthouse in council bluffs iowa they earn their own living in stores restaurants factories and offices they're chummy and honest and free and tender and sassy and they look life straight in the eye they've met man face to face and discovered that he's a poor creature they've dropped to it that the reports in the seaside library about his being a fairy prince lack confirmation mame was that sort she was full of life and fun and breezy she passed the repartee with the boarders quick as a wink you'd have smothered laughing i am disinclined to make excavations into the insides of personal affection i am glued to the theory that the diversions and discrepancies of the indisposition known as love should be as private a sentiment as a toothbrush tis my opinion that the biographies of the heart should be confined with the historical romances of the liver to the advertising pages of the magazines so you'll excuse the lack of an itemized bill of my feelings toward mame pretty soon i got a regular habit of dropping into the tent to eat at irregular times when there wasn't so many around mame would sail in with a smile in a black dress and white apron and say hello jeff why don't you come at meal time want to see how much trouble you can be of course fried chicken beef steak pork chops ham and eggs pot pie and so on she calls me jeff but there was no significations attached designations was all she meant the front names of any of us she used as they came to hand i'd eat about two meals before i left and string em out like a society spread where they change plates and wives and josh one another festively between bites mame stood for it pleasant for it wasn't up to her to take any canvas off the tent by declining dollars just because they were whipped in after meal times it wasn't long until there was another fellow named ed collier got the between meals affliction and him and me put in bridges between breakfast and dinner and dinner and supper that made a three-ringed surface of that tent and mame's turn as waiter a continuous performance that collier man was saturated with designs and contrivings he was in well-boring or insurance or claim jumping or something i've forgotten which he was a man well lubricated with gentility and his words were such as recommended you to his point of view so collier and me infested the grub tent with care and activity mame was level full of impartiality twas like a casino hand the way she dealt out her favors one to collier and one to me and one to the board and not a card up her sleeve me and collier naturally got acquainted and gravitated together some on the outside the best of his stratagems he seemed to be a pleasant chap full of an amiable sort of hostility 
i notice you have an affinity for grubbing in the banquet hall after the guests have fled says i to him one day to draw his conclusions why yes says collier reflecting the tumult of a crowded board seems to harass my sensitive nerves it exasperates mine some too says i nice little girl don't you think i see says collier laughing well now that you mention it i have noticed that she doesn't seem to displease the optic nerve she's a joy to mine says i and i'm going after her notice is hereby served i'll be as candid as you admits collier and if the drug stores don't run out of pepsin i'll give you a run for your money that'll leave you a dyspeptic at the wind-up so collier and me begins the race the grub department lays in new supplies mame waits on us jolly and kind and agreeable and it looks like an even break with cupid and the cook working overtime in dugan's restaurant twas one night in september when i got mame to take a walk after supper when the things were all cleared away we strolled out a distance and sat on a pile of lumber at the edge of town such opportunities was seldom so i spoke my piece explaining how the brazilian diamonds and the fire kindler were laying up sufficient treasure to guarantee the happiness of two and that both of them together couldn't equal the light from somebody's eyes and that the name of dugan should be changed to peters or reasons why not would be in order mame didn't say anything right away directly she gave a kind of shudder and i began to learn something jeff she says i'm sorry you spoke i like you as well as any of them but there isn't a man in the world i'd ever marry and there never will be do you know what a man is in my eye he's a tomb he's a sarcophagus for the interment of beefsteak pork chops liver and bacon ham and eggs he's that and nothing more for two years i've watched men eat 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 until they represent nothing on earth to me but ruminant bipeds they are absolutely nothing but something that goes in front of a knife and fork and plate at the table they're fixed that way in my mind and memory i've tried to overcome it but i can't i've heard girls rave about their sweethearts but i never could understand it a man and a sausage grinder and a pantry awaken me exactly the same sentiments i went to a matinee once to see an actor the girls were crazy about i got interested enough to wonder whether he liked his steak rare medium or well done and his eggs over or straight up that was all no jeff i'll marry no man and see him sit at the breakfast table and eat and come back to dinner and eat and happen in again at supper to eat 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 but may says i it'll wear off you've had too much of it you'll marry some time of course men don't eat always as far as my observation goes they do no i'll tell you what i'm going to do mame turns sudden to animation and bright eyes there's a girl named susie foster in terre haute a chum of mine she waits in the railroad eating-house there i worked two years in a restaurant in that town susie has it worse than i do because the men who eat at railroad stations gobble they try to flirt and gobble at the same time Whew. susie and i have it all planned out we're saving our money and when we get enough we're going to buy a little cottage and five acres we know of and live together and grow violets for the eastern market a man better not bring his appetite within a mile of that ranch don't girls ever i commenced but mame heads me off sharp no they don't they nibble a little bit sometimes that's all i thought the confect for goodness sake change the subject says mame as i said before that experience puts me wise that the feminine arrangement ever struggles after deceptions and illusions take england beef mater wiener's elevated germany uncle sam owes his greatness to fried chicken and pie but the young ladies of the she talk you schools they'll never believe it shakespeare they allow and rubenstein and the rough riders is what did the trick 
twas a situation calculated to disturb i couldn't bear to give up maine and yet it pained me to think of abandoning the practice of eating i had acquired the habit too early for twenty-seven years i had been blindly rushing upon my fate yielding to the insidious lures of that deadly monster food it was too late i was a ruminant biped for keeps it was lobster salad to a doughnut that my life was going to be blighted by it i continued to board at the dugan tent hoping that mame would relent i had sufficient faith in true love to believe that since it has often outlived the absence of a square meal it might in time overcome the presence of one i went on ministering to my fatal vice although i felt that each time i shoved a potato into my mouth in mame's presence i might be burying my fondest hopes i think collier must have spoken to mame and got the same answer for one day he orders a cup of coffee and a cracker and sits nibbling the corner of it like a girl in the parlor that's filled up in the kitchen previous on cold roast and fried cabbage i caught on and did the same and maybe we thought we'd made a hit the next day we tried it again and out comes old man dugan fetching in his hands the fairy viands kinder off your feed ain't you gents he asked fatherly and some sardonic thought i'd spell mame a bit seeing the work was light and my rheumatiz can stand the strain so back me and collier had to drop to the heavy grub again i noticed about that time that i was seized by a most uncommon and devastating appetite i ate until mame must have hated to see me darken the door afterward i found out that i had been made the victim of the first dark and irreligious trick played on me by ed collier him and me had been taking drinks together uptown regular trying to drown our thirst for food that man had bribed about ten bartenders to always put a big slug of apple trees anaconda appetite bitters in every one of my drinks but the last trick he played me was hardest to forget one day collier failed to show up at the tent a man told me he left town that morning my rival now was the bill of fare a few days before he left collier had presented me with a two-gallon jug of fine whiskey which he said a cousin had sent him from kentucky i now have reason to believe that it contained apple trees anaconda appetite bitters almost exclusively i continued to devour tons of provisions in mame's eyes i remained a mere biped more ruminant than ever about a week after collier pulled his freight there came a kind of sideshow to town and hoisted a tent near the railroad i judged it was a sort of fake museum and curiosity business i called to see mame one night and ma dugan said that she and thomas her younger brother had gone to the show that same thing happened for three nights that week saturday night i caught her on the way coming back and got to sit on the steps a while and talk to her i noticed she looked different her eyes were softer and shiny like instead of a main dugan to fly from the veracity of man and raise violets she seemed to be a mame more in line as god intended her approachable and suited to bask in the light of the brazilians and the kindler you seem to be right smart and bagel said i with the unparalleled exhibition of the world's living curiosities and wonders it's a change says mame you'll need another says i if you keep on going every night don't be cross jeff says she it takes my mind off business don't the curiosities eat i asked not all of them some of them are wax look out then that you don't get stuck says i kind of flip and foolish mame blushed i didn't know what to think about her my hopes raised some that perhaps my attentions had palliated man's awful crime of visibly introducing nourishment into his system she talked some about the stars referring to them with respect and politeness and i dribbled a quantity about united hearts homes made bright by true affection and the kindler mame listened without scorn and i says to myself 
jeff old man you're removing the hoodoo that has clung to the consumer of victuals you're setting your heel upon the serpent that lurks in the gravy bowl monday night i drop around mame is at the unparalleled exhibition with thomas now may the curse of the forty-one seven-sided sea cooks says i and the bad luck of the nine impenitent grasshoppers rest upon this self-same side show at once and for evermore amen i'll go to see it myself to-morrow night and investigate his baleful charm shall man that was made to inherit the earth be bereft of his sweetheart first by a knife and fork and then by a ten-cent circus the next night before starting out for the exhibition tent i inquire and find out that mame is not at home she is not at the circus with thomas this time for thomas waylays me in the grass outside of the grub tent with a scheme of his own before i had time to eat supper what will you give me jeff says he if i tell you something the value of it son i says sis is stuck on a freak says thomas one of the sideshow freaks i don't like him she does i overheard em talking thought maybe you'd like to know say jeff does it put you wise two dollars worth there's a target rifle up town that i frisked my pockets and commenced to dribble a stream of halves and quarters into thomas's hat the information was of the pile-driver system of news and it telescoped my intellects for a while while i was leaking small change and smiling foolish on the outside and suffering disturbances internally i was saying idiotically and pleasantly thank you thomas thank you er uh, a freak it said thomas now could you make out the monstrosity's entitlements a little clearer if you please thomas this is the fellow says thomas pulling out a yellow handbill from his pocket and shoving it under my nose he's the champion faster of the universe i guess that's why sis got soft on him he don't eat nothing he's going to fast forty-nine days this is the sixth that's him i looked at the name thomas pointed out professor eduardo colliari ah says i in admiration that's not so bad ed collier i give you credit for the trick but i don't give you the girl until she's mrs freight i hit the sod in the direction of the show i came up to the rear of the tent and as i did so a man wiggled out like a snake from under the bottom of the canvas scrambled to his feet and ran into me like a locoed bronco i gathered him up by the neck and investigated him by the light of the stars it is professor eduardo colliery in human habiliments with a desperate look in one eye and impatience in the other hello curiosity says i get still a minute and let's have a look at your freak ship how do you like being the wallopus wallopus or the bim bam from borneo or whatever name you are denounced by in the sideshow business jeff peters says collier in a weak voice turn me loose or i'll slug you one i'm in the extremest kind of a large hurry hands off tut tut eddie i answers holding him hard let an old friend gaze on the exhibition of your curiousness it's an imminent graft you fell into my son but don't speak of assaults and battery because you're not fit the best you've got is a lot of nerve and a mighty empty stomach and so it was the man was as weak as a vegetarian cat i'd argue this case with you jeff says he regretful in his style for an unlimited number of rounds if i had half an hour to train in and a slab of beefsteak two feet square to train with curse the man i say that invented the art of going foodless may his soul in eternity be chained up within two feet of a bottomless pit of red-hot hash i'm abandoning the conflict jeff i'm deserting to the enemy you'll find miss dugan inside contemplating the only living mummy and the informed hog she's a fine girl jeff i'd have beat you out if i could have kept up the grubless habit a little while longer you'll have to admit that the fasting dodge was aces up for a while 
i figured it out that way but say jeff it's sad that love makes the world go round let me tell you the announcement lacks verification it's the wind from the dinner horn that does it i love that mame dugan i've gone six days without food in order to coincide with her sentiments only one bite did i have that was when i knocked the tattooed man down with a war club and got a sandwich he was gobbling the manager fined me all my salary but salary wasn't what i was after twas that girl i'd give my life for her but i'd endanger my immortal soul for a beef stew hunger is a horrible thing jeff love and business and family and religion and art and patriotism are nothing but shadows of words when a man's starving in such language ed collier discoursed to me pathetic i gathered the diagnosis that his affections and his digestions had been implicated in a scramble and the commissary had won out i never disliked ed collier i searched my internal admonitions of suitable etiquette to see if i could find a remark of a consoling nature but there was not convenient i'd be glad now says ed if you'll let me go i've been hard hit but i'll hit the ration supply harder i'm going to clean out every restaurant in town i'm going to wade waist deep in sirloins and swim in ham and eggs it's an awful thing jeff peters for a man to come to this pass to give up his girl for something to eat it's worse than that man esau that swapped his copyright for a partridge but then hunger's a fierce thing you'll excuse me now jeff for i smell a pervasion of ham frying in the distance and my legs are crying out to stampede in that direction a hearty meal to you ed collier i says to him and no hard feelings for myself i am projected to be an unseldom eater and i have condolence for your predicaments there was a sudden big whiff of frying ham smell on the breeze and the champion faster gives a snort and gallops off in the dark toward fodder i wish some of the cultured outfit that are always advertising the extenuating circumstances of love and romance had been there to see there was ed collier a fine man full of contrivances and flirtations abandoning the girl of his heart and ripping out into the contiguous territory in the pursuit of sordid grub twas a rebuke to the poets and a slap at the best-paying element of fiction an empty stomach is a sure antidote to an overfull heart i was naturally anxious to know how far mame was infatuated with collier and his stratagems i went inside the unparalleled exhibition and there she was she looked surprised to see me but i'm guilty it's an elegant evening outside says i the coolness is quite nice and gratifying and the stars are lined out first class up where they belong wouldn't you shake these by-products of the animal kingdom long enough to take a walk with a common human who never was on a program in his life mame gave a sort of sly glance around and i knew what that meant oh says i i hate to tell you but the curiosity that lives on wind has flew the coop he just crawled out under the tent by this time he has amalgamated himself with half the delicatessen truck in town you mean ed collier says mame i do i answers and a pity it is that he has gone back to crime again i met him outside the tent and he exposed his intentions of devastating the food crop of the world tis enormously sad when one's ideal descends from his pedestal to make a seventeen-year locust of himself mame looked me straight in the eye until she had corkscrewed my reflections jeff says she it isn't quite like you to talk that way i don't care to hear ed collier ridiculed a man may do ridiculous things but they don't look ridiculous to the girl he doesn't for that was one man in a hundred he stopped eating just to please me i'd be hard-hearted and ungrateful if i didn't feel kindly toward him could you do what he did i know says i seeing the point i'm condemned i can't help it 
the brand of the consumer is upon my brow mrs eve settled that business for me when she made the dicker with the snake i fell from the fire into the frying pan i guess i am the champion feaster of the universe i spoke humble and may mollified herself a little ed collier and i are good friends she said the same as me and you i gave him the same answer i did you no marrying for me i like to be with ed and talk with him there was something mighty pleasant to me in the thought that here was a man who never used a knife and fork and all for my sake wasn't you in love with him i asked all injudicious wasn't there a deal on for you to become mrs curiosity all of us do it sometimes all of us get jostled out of the line of profitable talk now and then mame put on that little lemon glacé smile that runs between ice and sugar and says much too pleasant you're short on credentials for asking that question mr peters suppose you do a forty-nine day fast just to give you ground to stand on and then maybe i'll answer it so even after collier was kidnapped out of the way by the revolt of his appetite my own prospects with mame didn't seem to be improved and then business played out in guthrie i had stayed too long there the brazilians i had sold commenced to show signs of wear and the kindler refused to light up right frequent on wet mornings there is always a time in my business when the star of success says move on to the next town i was traveling by wagon at that time so as not to miss any of the small towns so i hitched up a few days later and went down to tell maine good-bye i wasn't abandoning the game i intended running over to oklahoma city and work it for a week or two then i was coming back to institute fresh proceedings against maine what do i find at the dickens but mame all conspicuous in a blue travelling dress with her little trunk at the door it seems that sister lottie bell who is a typewriter in terre haute is going to be married next thursday and mame is off for a week's visit to be an accomplice at the ceremony mame is waiting for a freight wagon that is going to take her to oklahoma but i condemns the freight wagon with promptness and scorn and offers to deliver the goods myself ma dugan sees no reason why not as mr freighter wants pay for the job so thirty minutes later mame and i pull out in my light spring wagon with white canvas cover and head due south that morning was of a praiseworthy sort the breeze was lively and smelled excellent of flowers and grass and little cottontail rabbits entertained themselves with skylarking across the road my two kentucky bays went for the horizon until it comes sailing in so fast you wanted to dodge it like a clothesline mame was full of talk and rattled on like a kid about her old home and her school pranks and the things she liked and the hateful ways of those johnson girls just across the street way up in indiana not a word was said about ed collier or victuals or some solemn subjects about noon mame looks and finds that the lunch she had put up in a basket had been left behind i could have managed quite a collation but mame didn't seem to be grieving over nothing to eat so i made no lamentations it was a sore subject with me and i ruled provender in all its branches out of my conversation i am minded to touch light on explanations how i came to lose the way the road was dim and well grown with grass and there was mame by my side confiscating my intellects and attention the excuses are good or they are not as they may appear to you but i lost it and at dusk that afternoon when we should have been in oklahoma city we were seesawing along the edge of nowhere in some undiscovered river bottom and the rain was falling in large wet bunches down there in the swamps we saw a little log house on a small knoll of high ground the bottom grass and the chaparral and the lonesome timber crowded all round it it seemed to be a melancholy little house and you felt sorry for it twas that house for the night the way i reasoned it i explained to mame and she leaves it to me to decide 
she doesn't become galvanic and prosecuting as most women would but she says it's all right she knows i didn't mean to do it we found the house was deserted it had two empty rooms there was a little shed in the yard where beasts had once been kept in a loft of it was a lot of old hay i put my horses in there and gave them some of it for which they looked at me sorrowful expecting apologies the rest of the hay i carried into the house by armfuls with a view to accommodations i also brought in the patent kindler and the brazilians neither of which are guaranteed against the action of water mame and i sat on the wagon seats on the floor and i lit a lot of the kindler on the hearth for the night was chilly if i was any judge that girl enjoyed it it was a change for her it gave her a different point of view she laughed and talked and the kindler made a dim light compared to her eyes i had a pocket full of cigars and as far as i was concerned there had never been any fall of man we were at the same old stand in the garden of eden out there somewhere in the rain and the dark was the river of zion and the angel with the flaming sword had not yet put up the keep off the grass sign i opened up a gross or two of the brazilians and made mame put them on rings brooches necklaces eardrops bracelets girdles and lockets she flashed and sparkled like a million-dollar princess until she had pink spots in her cheeks and almost cried for a looking-glass when it got late i made a fine bunk on the floor for mame with the hay and my lap robes and blankets out of the wagon and persuaded her to lie down i sat in the other room burning tobacco and listening to the pouring rain and meditating on the many vicissitudes that came to a man during the seventy years or so immediately preceding his funeral i must have dozed a little while before morning for my eyes were shut and when i opened them it was daylight and there stood mame with her hair all done up neat and correct and her eyes bright with admiration of existence gee whiz jeff she exclaims but i'm hungry i could eat up i looked up and caught her eye her smile went back in and she gave me a cold look of suspicion then i laughed and laid down on the floor to laugh easier it seemed funny to me by nature and geniality i am a hearty laugher and i went the limit when i came to mame was sitting with her back to me all contaminated with dignity don't be angry mame i says for i couldn't help it it's the funny way you've done up your hair if you could only see it you needn't tell stories sir said mame cool and advised my hair is all right i know what you were laughing about why jeff look outside she winds up peeping through a chink between the logs i opened the little wooden window and looked out the entire river bottom was flooded and the knob of land on which the house stood was an island in the middle of a rushing stream of yellow water a hundred yards wide and it was still raining hard all we could do was to stay there till the doves brought in the olive branch i am bound to admit that conversations and amusements languished during that day i was aware that mame was getting a too prolonged one-sided view of things again but i had no way to change it personally i was wrapped up in the desire to eat i had hallucinations of hash and visions of ham and i kept saying to myself all the time what'll you have to eat jeff what'll you order now old man when the waiter comes i picks out to myself all sorts of favorites from the bill of fare and imagines them coming i guess it's that way with all hungry men they can't get their cogitations trained on anything but something to eat it shows that the little table with the broken-legged caster and the imitation worcester sauce and the napkin covering up the coffee stains is the paramount issue after all instead of the question of immortality or peace between nations i sat there musing along arguing with myself quite heated as to how i'd have my steak with mushrooms or a la creole mame was on the other seat pensive her head leaning on her hand let the potatoes come home fried i states in my mind and brown the hash in the pan with nine poached eggs on the side i felt careful 
in my own pockets to see if i could find a peanut or a grain or two of popcorn night came on again with the river still rising and the rain still falling i looked at mame and i noticed that desperate look on her face that a girl always wears when she passes an ice-cream lair i knew that poor girl was hungry maybe for the first time in her life there was that anxious look in her eye that a woman has only when she has missed a meal or feels her skirt coming unfastened in the back it was about eleven o'clock or so on the second night when we sat gloomy in our shipwrecked cabin i kept jerking my mind away from the subject of food but it kept flopping back again before i could fasten it i thought of everything good to eat i had ever heard of i went away back to my kidhood and remembered the hot biscuits sopped in sorghum and bacon gravy with partiality and respect then i trailed along up the years pausing at green apples and salt flapjacks and maple lye hominy fried chicken old virginia style corn on the cob spare ribs and sweet potato pie and wound up with georgia brunswick stew which is the top notch of good things to eat because it comprises them all they say a drowning man sees a panorama of his whole life pass before him well when a man's starving he sees the ghost of every meal he ever ate set out before him and he invents new dishes that would make the fortune of a chef if somebody would collect the last words of men who starved to death they'd have to sift a mighty fine to discover the sentiment but they'd compile into a cookbook that would sell into the millions i guess i must have had my conscience pretty well inflicted with culinary meditations for without intending to do so i says out loud to the imaginary waiter cut it thick and have it rare with a french fried and six sauce scrambled on toast mame turned her head quick as a wing her eyes were sparkling and she smiled sudden mame for me she rattles out with the juliennes and three straight up draw one and brown the weeds double order to come oh jeff wouldn't it be glorious and then i'd like to have a half fry and a little chicken curry with rice and a cup of custard with ice cream and go easy i interrupts where's the chicken liver pie and the kidney saute on toast and the roast lamb and oh cuts in maine all excited with mint sauce and the turkey salad and stuffed olives and raspberry tarts and keep it going says i hurry up with the fried squash and the hot corn pone with sweet milk and don't forget the apple dumpling with hard sauce and the cross-bar dewberry pie yes for ten minutes we kept up that kind of restaurant repartee we ranges up and down and backward and forward over the main trunk lines and the branches of the victuals subject and mame leads the game for she is apprised in the ramifications of grub and the dishes she nominates aggravates my yearnings it seems that there is a feeling that mame will line up friendly again with food it seems that she looks upon the obnoxious science of eating with less contempt than before the next morning we find that the flood has subsided i geared up the bays and we splashed out through the mud some precarious until we found the road again we were only a few miles wrong and in two hours we were in oklahoma city the first thing we saw was a big restaurant sign and we piled into there in a hurry here i finds myself sitting with mame at table with the knives and forks and plates between us and she not scornful but smiling with starvation and sweetness twas a new restaurant and well stocked i designated a list of quotations from the bill of fare that made the waiter look out toward the wagon to see how many more might be coming there we were and there was the order being served twas a banquet for a dozen but we felt like a dozen i looked across the table at mame and smiled for i had recollections mame was looking at the table like a boy looks at his first stem winder then she looked at me straight in the face and two big tears came in her eyes the waiter was gone after more grub jeff she says soft like i've been a foolish girl i've looked at things from the wrong side i never felt this way before men get hungry every day like this don't they 
they're big and strong and they do the hard work of the world and they don't eat just to spite silly waiter girls in restaurants do they jeff you said once that is you asked me you wanted me to well jeff if you still care i'd be glad and willing to have you always sitting across the table from me now give me something to eat quick please so as i said a woman needs to change her point of view now and then they get tired of the same old sights the same old dinner table wash tub and sewing machine give em a touch of the various a little travel and a little rest a little tomfoolery along with the tragedies of keeping house a little petting after the blowing up a little upsetting and a little jostling around and everybody in the game will have chips added to their stack by the play end of cupid a la carte by o henry a delicate affair by grace e king this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org reading by mount ferrari a delicate affair by grace e king but what does this extraordinary display of light mean ejaculated my aunt the moment she entered the parlor from the dining-room it looks like the kingdom of heaven in here jewels jewels she cried come and put out some of the light jules was at the front door letting in the usual wednesday evening visitor but now he came running in immediately with his own invention in the way of a gas stick a piece of broom handle notched at the end and began turning one tap after the other until the room was reduced to complete darkness but what do you mean now jules screamed the old lady again pardon madame answered jules with dignity it is an accident i thought there was one still lighted an accident an accident do you think i hire you to perform accidents for me you are just through telling me that it was accident made you give me both soup and gumbo for dinner to-day but accidents can always happen madame persisted jules adhering to his position the chandelier a design of originality in its day gave light by what purported to be wax candles standing each in a circlet of pendant crystals the usual smile of ecstatic admiration spread over jules's features as he touched the match to the simulated wicks and lighted into life the rainbows in the prisms underneath it was a smile that did not heighten the intelligence of his features revealing as it did the toothless condition of his gums what will madame have for her dinner to-morrow looking benignantly at his mistress and still standing under his aureole do i ever give orders for one dinner with the other one still on my lips i only ask madame there is no harm in asking he walked away his long stiff white apron rattling like a petticoat about him catching sight of the visitor still standing at the threshold oh madame here is mr horace shall i let him in idiot every wednesday you ask me that question and every wednesday i answer the same way don't you think i could tell you when not to let him in without your asking oh well madame one never knows it is always safe to ask the appearance of the gentleman started a fresh subject of excitement jules jules you have left that front door unlocked again excuse me said mr horace jules did not leave the front door unlocked it was locked when i rang and he locked it again most carefully after letting me in i have been standing outside all the while the gas was being extinguished and relighted ah very well then and what is the news she sank into her armchair pulled her little card table closer and began shuffling the cards upon it for her game of solitaire i never hear any news you know she nodding toward me goes out but she never learns anything she is as stupid to-night as an empty bottle after a few passes her hands which were slightly tremulous regained some of their wonted steadiness and brilliancy of movement and the cards dropped rapidly on the table mr horace 
as he had got into the habit of doing watched her mechanically rather absent-mindedly retailing what he imagined would interest her from his week's observation and hearsay and madame's little world revolved complete for her in time place and personality it was an old-fashioned square room with long ceiling and broad low windows heavily curtained with stiff silk brocade faded by time into mellowness the tall white-painted mantel carried its obligation of ornaments well a gilt clock which under a glass case related some brilliant poetical idol and told the hours only in an insignificant aside according to the delicate politeness of bygone french taste flanked by duplicate continuations of the same idol in companion candelabra also under glass sevres or imitation sevres faces and a crowd of smaller objects to which age and rarity were slowly contributing an artistic value an oval mirror behind threw replicas of them into another mirror receiving in exchange the reflected portrait of madame in her youth and in the partial nudity in which innocence was limned in madame's youth there were besides mirrors on the other three walls of the room all hung with such careful intent for the exercise of their vocation that the apartment in spots extended indefinitely the brilliant chandelier was thereby quadrupled and the furniture and ornaments multiplied everywhere and most unexpectedly into twins and triplets producing such sociabilities among them and forcing such correspondences between inanimate objects with such hospitable insistence that the effect was full of gaiety and life although the interchange in reality was the mere repetition of one original a kind of phonographic echo the portrait of monsieur madame's handsome young husband hung out of the circle of radiance in the isolation that wherever they hang always seem to surround the portraits of the dead old as the parlors appeared madame antedated them by the sixteen years she had lived before her marriage which had been the occasion of their furnishment she had travelled a considerable distance over the sands of time since the epoch commemorated by the portrait indeed it would require almost documentary evidence to prove that she who now was arriving at eighty was the same atalanta that had started out so buoyantly at sixteen instead of a cap she wore black lace over her head pinned with gold brooches her white hair curled naturally over a low forehead her complexion showed care and powder her eyes were still bright not with the effete intelligence of old age but with actual potency she wore a loose black sack flowered in purple and over that a black lace mantle fastened with more gold brooches she played her game of solitaire rapidly impatiently and always won for she never hesitated to cheat to get out of a tight place or into a favourable one cheating with the quickness of a flash and forgetting it the moment afterward mr horace was as old as she but he looked much younger although his dress and appearance betrayed no evidence of an effort in that direction whenever his friend cheated he would invariably call her attention to it and as usual she would shrug her shoulders and say bah lose a game for a card and pursue the conversation he happened to mention mushrooms fresh mushrooms she threw down her cards before the words were out of his mouth and began to call jules jules mr horace pulled the bell cord but madame was too excitable for that means of communication she ran into the antechamber and put her head over the banisters calling jules jules louder and louder she might have heard jules slippered feet running from the street into the corridor and upstairs had she not been so deaf he appeared at the door but where have you been here i have been raising the house a half hour calling you you have been in the street i am sure you have been in the street madame is very much mistaken answered jules with resentful dignity he had taken off his white apron of waiter and was disreputable in all the shabbiness of his attire as cook when madame forbids me to go into the street i do not go into the street i was in the kitchen i had fallen asleep 
what does madame desire smiling benevolently what is this i hear fresh mushrooms in the market eh madame fresh mushrooms in the market and you have not brought me any madame there are fresh mushrooms everywhere in the market waving his hand to show their universality everybody is eating them old pomponette jules continued only this morning offered me a plate piled up high for ten cents idiot why did you not buy them if madame had said so but madame did not say so madame said soup jewels carrots rice counting on his fingers and the gumbo i have explained that that was an accident madame said soup enumerating his menu again madame never once said mushrooms but how could i know there were mushrooms in the market do i go to market that is it and jules smiled at the question thus settled if you had told me there were mushrooms in the market pursued madame persisting in treating jules as a reasonable being why did not madame ask me if madame had asked me surely i would have told madame yesterday caesar brought them to the door a whole bucketful for twenty-five cents i had to shut the door in his face to get rid of him triumphantly and you brought me yesterday those detestable peas ah shrugging his shoulders madame told me to buy what i saw i saw peas i bought them well understand now once for all whenever you see mushrooms no matter what i ordered you buy them do you hear no madame surely i cannot buy mushrooms unless madame orders them madame's disposition is too quick but i do order them stupid i do order them i tell you to buy them every day and if there are none in the market every day go away get out of my sight i do not want to see you ah it is unendurable i must i must get rid of him this last was not a threat as jules knew only too well it was merely a habitual exclamation during the colloquy mr horace leaning back in his armchair raised his eyes and caught the reflected portrait of madame in the mirror before him the reflection so much softer and prettier so much more ethereal than the original painting indeed seen in the mirror that way the portrait was as refreshing as the most charming memory he pointed to it when madame with considerable loss of temper regained her seat it is as beautiful as the past he explained most unnaturally for he and his friend had a horror of looking at the long long past which could not fail to remind them of what no one cares to contemplate out of church making an effort towards some determination which a subtle observer might have noticed weighing upon him all the evening he added and apropos of the past hang interrogated the old lady impatiently still under the influence of her irascibility about the mushrooms he moved his chair closer and bent forward as if his communication were to be confidential ah bah speak louder she cried one would suppose you had some secret to tell what secrets can there be at our age she took up her cards and began to play there could be no one who bothered herself less about the forms of politeness yes yes answered mr horace throwing himself back into his chair what secrets can there be at our age the remark seemed a pregnant one to him he gave himself up to it one must evidently be the age of one's thoughts mr horace's thoughts revealed him the old man he was the lines in his face deepened into wrinkles his white moustache could not pretend to conceal his mouth worsened by the loss of a tooth or two and the long thin hand that propped his head was crossed with blue distended veins at the last judgment it was a favourite quotation with him the book of our conscience will be read aloud before the whole company but the old lady deep in her game paid no more heed to his quotation than to him he made a gesture toward her portrait when was that painted josephine madame threw a glance after the gesture the time was so long ago the mythology of greece hardly more distant at eighty the golden age of youth must indeed appear an evanescent myth madame's ideas seemed to take that direction ah 
at that time we were all nymphs and you all demigods demigods and nymphs yes but there was one among us who was a god with you all the illusion a frequent one with mr horace was to madame's husband who in his day it is said had indeed played the god in the little arcadia of society she shrugged her shoulders the truth is so little of a compliment the old gentleman sighed in an abstracted way and madame although apparently absorbed in her game lent her ear it is safe to say that a woman is never too old to hear a sigh wafted in her direction josephine do you remember in your memory she pretended not to hear remember who ever heard of her forgetting but she was not the woman to say at a moment's notice what she remembered or what she forgot a woman's memory when i think of a woman's memory in fact i do not like to think of a woman's memory one can intrude in imagination into many places but a woman's memory mr horace seemed to lose his thread it had been said of him in his youth that he wrote poetry and it was said against him it was evidently such lapses as these that had given rise to the accusation and as there was no one less impatient under sentiment or poetry than madame her feet began to agitate themselves as if jules were perorating some of his culinary inanities before her and a man's memory totally misunderstanding him it is not there that i either would penetrate my friend a man when madame began to talk about men she was prompted by imagination just as much as was mr horace when he talked about women but what a difference in their sentiments and yet he had received so little and she so much from the subjects of their inspiration but that seems to be the way in life or in imagination that you should he paused with the curious shyness of the old before the word love that you too should marry seemed natural inevitable at the time tradition records exactly the same comment by society at the time on the marriage in question society is ever fatalistic in its comments but the natural the inevitable do we not sometimes i wonder perform them as jules does his accidents ah do not talk about that idiot an idiot born and bred i won't have him about me he is a monstrosity i tell his grandmother that every day when she comes to comb me what a farce what a ridiculous farce comfortable existence has become with us fresh mushrooms in market and bring me carrots the old gentleman partly from long knowledge of her habit or from an equally persistent bend of his own quietly held on to his idea one cannot tell it seems so at the time we like to think it so it makes it easier and yet looking back on our future as we once looked forward to it eh but who wants to look back on it my friend who in the world wants to look back on it one could not doubt madame's energy of opinion on that question to hear her voice we have done our future we have performed it if you will our future it is like the dinners we have eaten of course we cannot remember the good without becoming exasperated over the bad but shrugging her shoulders since we cannot beat the cooks we must submit to fate forcing a queen that she needed at the critical point of her game at sixteen and twenty-one it is hard to realize that one is arranging one's life to last until sixty seventy forever correcting himself as he thought of his friend the dead husband if madame had ever possessed the art of self-control it was many a long day since she had exercised it now she frankly began to show ennui when i look back to that time mr horace leaned back in his chair and half closed his eyes perhaps to avoid the expression of her face i see nothing but lights and flowers i hear nothing but music and laughter and all lights and flowers and music and laughter seem to meet in this room where we met so often to arrange our inevitabilities the word appeared to attract him josephine with a sudden change of voice and manner josephine how beautiful you were 
the old lady nodded her head without looking from her cards they used to say with sad conviction of the truth of his testimony the men used to say that your beauty was irresistible none ever withstood you none ever could that after all was mr horace's great charm with madame he was so faithful to the illusions of his youth as he looked now at her one could almost feel the irresistibility of which he spoke it was only their excuse perhaps we could not tell at the time we cannot tell even now when we think about it they said then talking as men talk over such things that you were the only one who could remain yourself under the circumstances you were the only one who could know who could will under the circumstances it was their theory men can have only theories about such things his voice dropped and he seemed to drop too into some abysm of thought madame looked into the mirror where she could see the face of the one who alone could retain her presence of mind under the circumstances suggested by mr horace she could also have seen had she wished it among the reflected bric-a-brac on the mantel the corner of the frame that held the picture of her husband but peradventure classing it with the past which held so many unavenged bad dinners she never thought to link it even by a look with her emotions of the present indeed it had been said of her that in past present and future there had ever been but the one picture to interest her eyes the one she was looking at now this however was the remark of the uninitiated for the true passion of a beautiful woman is never so much for her beauty as for its booty as the passion of a gamester is for his game not for his luck how beautiful she was it was apparently down in the depths of his abysm that he found the connection between this phrase and his last and it was evidently to himself he said it madame however heard and understood too in fact traced back to a certain period her thoughts and mr horace's must have been fed by pretty much the same subjects but she had so carefully barricaded certain issues in her memory as almost to obstruct their flow into her life if she were a cook one would say that it was her bad dinners which she was trying to keep out of remembrance you there he there she there i there he pointed to the places on the carpet under the chandelier he could have touched them with a walking-stick and the recollection seemed just as close she was in truth what we men called her then it was her eyes that first suggested it myosotis the little blue flower the forget-me-not it suited her better than her own name we always called her that among ourselves how beautiful she was he leaned his head on his hand and looked where he had seen her last so long such an eternity ago it must be explained for the benefit of those who do not live in the little world where an illusion is all that is necessary to put one in full possession of any drama domestic or social that mr horace was speaking of the wedding night of madame when the bridal party stood as he described under the chandelier the bride and groom with each one's best friend it may be said that it was the last night or time that madame had a best friend of her own sex social gossip with characteristic kindness had furnished reasons to suit all tastes why madame had ceased that night to have a best friend of her own sex if gossip had not done so society would still be left to its imagination for information for madame never tolerated the smallest appeal to her for enlightenment what the general taste seemed most to relish as a version was that madame in her marriage had triumphed not conquered and that the night of her wedding she had realized the fact and to be frank had realized it ever since in short madame had played then to gain at love as she played now to gain at solitaire and hearts were no more than cards to her and bah lose a game for a card must have been always her motto it is hard to explain it delicately enough for these are the most delicate affairs in life but the image of 
myosotis had passed through monsieur's heart and myosotis does mean forget me not and madame well knew that to love monsieur once was to love him always in spite of jealousy doubt distrust nay unhappiness for to love him meant all this and more he was that kind of man they said whom women could love even against conscience madame never forgave that moment her friend at least she could put aside out of her intercourse unfortunately we cannot put people out of our lives god alone can do that and so far he had interfered in the matter only by removing monsieur it was known to notoriety that since her wedding madame had abandoned destroyed all knowledge of her friend and the friend she had disappeared as much as is possible for one in her position and with her duties what there is in blue eyes light hair and a fragile form to impress one i cannot tell but for us men it seems to me it is blue-eyed light-haired and fragile formed women that are the hardest to forget the less easy to forget corrected madame he paid no attention to the remark they are the women that attach themselves in one's memory if necessary to keep from being forgotten they come back into one's dreams and as life rolls on one wonders about them is she happy is she miserable goes life well or ill with her madame played her cards slowly one would say for her prosaically and there is always a pang when as one is so wondering the response comes that is the certainty in one's heart responds she is miserable and life goes ill with her then if ever men envy the power of god madame threw over the game she was in and began a new one such women should not be unhappy they are too fragile too sensitive too trusting i could never understand the infliction of misery upon them i could send death to them but not not misfortune madame forgetting again to cheat in time and losing her game began impatiently to shuffle her cards for a new deal and yet do you know josephine those women are the unhappy ones of life they seem predestined to it as others looking at madame's full charmed portrait are predestined to triumph and victory they unconscious in his abstraction of the personal nature of his simile never know how to handle their cards and they always play a losing game ha came from madame startled into an irate ejaculation it is their love always that is sacrificed their hearts always that are bruised one might say that god himself favors the black-haired ones as his voice sank lower and lower the room seemed to become stiller and stiller a passing vehicle in the street however now and then drew a shiver of sound from the pendant prisms of the chandelier she was so slight so fragile and always in white with blue in her hair to match her eyes and god knows what in her heart all the time and yet they stand it they bear it they do not die they live along with the strongest the happiest the most fortunate of us bitterly and raising his eyes to his old friend who thereupon immediately began to fumble her cards whenever in the street i see a poor bent broken woman's figure i know without verifying it any more by a glance that it is the wreck of a fair woman's feature whenever i hear of a bent broken existence i know without asking any more that it is the wreck of a fair woman's life poor mr horace spoke with the unreason of a superstitious bigot i have often thought since in large assemblies particularly in weddings josephine of what was going on in the women's hearts there and i have felt sorry for them and when i think of god's knowing what is in their hearts i have felt sorry for the men and i often think now josephine think oftener and oftener of it that if the resurrection trumpet of our childhood should sound some day no matter when out there 
over the old st louis cemetery and we should all have to rise from our long rest of oblivion what would be the first thing we should do and though there were a god and a heaven awaiting us by that same god josephine i believe that our first thought in awakening would be the last in dying confession and that our first rush would be to the feet of one another for forgiveness for there are some offences that must outlast the longest oblivion and a forgiveness that will be more necessary than god's own then our hearts will be bared to one another for if as you say there are no secrets at our age there can still be less cause for them after death his voice ended in the faintest whisper the table crashed over and the cards flew widespread on the floor before we could recover madame was in the antechamber screaming for jewels one would have said that from her face the old lady had witnessed the resurrection described by mr horace the rush of the spirits with their burdens of remorse the one to the feet of the other and she must have seen herself and her husband with a unanimity of purpose never apparent in their short married life rising from their common tomb and hastening to that other tomb at the end of the alley and falling at the feet of the one to whom in life he had been recreant in love she in friendship of course jules answered through the wrong door rushing in with his gas stick and turning off the gas in a moment we were involved in darkness and dispute but what does he mean what does the idiot mean he it was impossible for her to find a word to do justice to him and to her exasperation at the same time pardon madame it is not i it is the cathedral bell it is ringing nine o'clock but madame can hear it herself listen we could not see it but we were conscious of the benign toothless smile spreading over his face as the bell tones fell in the room but it is not the gas i pardon madame but it is the gas madame said jules put out the gas every night when the bell rings madame told me that only last night the bell rings i put out the gas will you be silent will you listen if madame wishes just as madame says but the old lady had turned to mr horace horace you have seen you know and it was a question now of overcoming emotion i i i a carriage my friend a carriage madame jules interrupted his smile to interrupt her she was walking around the room picking up a shawl here a lace there for she was always prepared against draughts madame continued jules pursuing her a carriage if madame would only listen i was going to say but madame is too quick in her disposition the carriage has been waiting since a long hour ago mr horace said to have it there in a half hour it was then she saw for the first time that it had all been prepared by mr horace the rest was easy enough getting into the carriage and finding the place of which mr horace had heard as he said only that afternoon in it on her bed of illness poverty and suffering lay the patient wasted form of the beautiful fair one whom men had called in her youth myasotis but she did not call her myasotis mon amour the old pet name although it had to be fetched across more than half a century of disuse flashed like lightning from madame's heart into the dim chamber Madavine came in counterflash from the curtained bed in the old days women or at least young girls could hazard such pet names one upon the other these think of it dated from the first communion class the dating period of so much of friendship my poor amour my poor poor divine the voices were together close beside the pillow i i began divine it could not have happened if god had not wished it interrupted poor amour with the resignation that comes alas only with the last drop of the bitter cup and that was about all if mr horace had not slipped away 
he might have noticed the curious absence of monsieur's name and of his own name in the murmuring that followed it would have given him some more ideas on the subject of woman at any rate the good god must thank him for having one affair the less to arrange when the trumpet sounds out there over the old st louis cemetery and he was none too premature for the old st louis cemetery as was shortly enough proved was a near reach for all three of the old friends End of a delicate affair by grace e king desire by james stevens from the june nineteen twenty edition of the dial this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org reading by matt Perard. desire by james stevens he was quite excited as he told the story to his wife and in the telling he revealed to her a depth of credulity of which she would not have believed him capable he was a hard-headed man and conducted his business on hard-headed principles indeed he had conducted his courtship and matrimonial affairs in a manner which she would not have termed reckless or romantic when therefore she found him excited and over such a story she did not know what to think she ended by agreeing with him not because her reason was satisfied or even touched but simply because he was excited and women generally welcome anything which disturbs or varies the dull round of use and wont and will bathe in excitement whenever they get the chance this was the story he told as he was walking down grafton street to lunch a motor-car came spinning down the road at a speed much too dangerous for that narrow and always congested thoroughfare a man was walking in front of him and just as the car came behind this man stepped off the path with a view to crossing the road he did not even look behind as he stepped off her husband on the moment stretched forth a long muscular arm that swept the man back to the pavement one second before the car went blaring and buzzing by if i had not been there said her husband the two men grinned at each other her husband smiling with good fellowship the other crinkling with amusement and gratitude they walked together down the street and they had lunch together they sat for a long time after lunch smoking innumerable cigarettes and engaged in a conversation which she could never have believed her husband would have stood for ten minutes and they parted with an expressed wish from her husband that they should meet again on the following day and a wordless smile from the man he had never ratified nor negatived the arrangement i hope he'll turn up said her husband it was this conversation had excited her man for it had drawn him into a mental atmosphere to which he was a stranger and he had found himself moving there with such ease and pleasure that he wished to get back to it as often and with as little delay as possible briefly as he explained it to her the atmosphere was religious and while it was entirely intellectual it was more heady and exhilarating than the emotional religion to which he had been accustomed and from which he had long since passed he tried to describe his companion but had such ill success that she could not remember afterwards whether he was tall or short fat or thin fair or dark it was the man's eyes only he succeeded in emphasizing and these it appeared were eyes such as he had never before seen in a human face that also he said was a wrong way of putting it for his eyes were exactly like everybody else's it was the way he looked through them that was different something very steady very ardent immensely quiet and powerful was using these eyes for purposes of vision he had never met any one who looked at him so comprehendingly so agreeably you are in love said she with a laugh after this her husband's explanations became more explanatory but not less confused 
until she found that they were both with curious unconsciousness in the middle of a fairy tale he asked me said her husband what was the thing i wished for beyond all things that is the most difficult question i have ever been invited to answer he went on and for nearly half an hour we sat quietly thinking it out and discussing various magnificences and chances in life i had all the usual thoughts and of course the first of them was wealth i mentioned it too tentatively as a possibility and he agreed that it was worth considering but after a while i knew that i did not want money one always has need of money said his wife in a way that is true said he but not in this way for as i thought it over i remembered that we have no children and we have few desires which the money we have already gathered cannot buy also we are fairly well off we have enough in the stocking to last our time even if i ceased from business which i am not going to do and in short i discovered that money or its purchasing power had not any particular advantages to offer all the same said she and halted with her eyes fixed on bonnets far away in time and space all the same he agreed with a smile i could not think of anything worth wishing for he continued i mentioned health and wisdom and we spoke of these but judging myself by the standard of the world in which we move i concluded that both my health and knowledge were as good as the next man's and i thought if i elected to become wiser than my contemporaries i might be a very lonely person for the rest of my days yes said she thoughtfully i am glad you did not ask to be made wise unless you could have asked it for both of us i asked him in the end what he would advise me to demand but he replied that he could not advise me at all behind everything stands desire said he and you must find out your desire i asked him then if the opportunity came to him what he would ask for not in order that i might copy his wish but from sheer curiosity and he replied that he would not ask for anything and i was about to adopt that attitude oh said his wife when an idea came to me here i am i said to myself forty-eight years of age rich enough sound enough in wind and limb and as wise as i can afford to be what is there now belonging to me absolutely mine but from which i must part and which i would like to keep and i saw that the thing which was leaving me day by day second by second irretrievably and inevitably was my forty-eight years and i thought i would like to continue at the age of forty-eight until my time was up i did not ask to live for ever or any of that nonsense but i asked to be allowed to stay at the age of forty-eight years with all the equipment of my present state unimpaired you should not have asked for such a thing said his wife a little angrily it is not fair to me you are older than i am now but in a few years this will mean that i shall be needlessly older than you i think it was not a loyal wish i thought of that objection said he and i also thought that i was past the age at which certain things matter and that both temperamentally and in the matter of years i was proof against well say female attractions or femininity of any kind it seemed to me to be right so i just registered my wish with him what did he say she queried he did not say anything he just nodded and began to talk again of other matters religion life death mind a host of things which for all the diversity they seem to have when i enumerate them were yet one single theme i feel a more contented man to-night than i have ever felt he continued and i feel in some curious way a different person from the man i was yesterday here his wife woke up as it were from the conversation and began to laugh you are a foolish man said she and i am just as bad if any one were to hear us talking this solemn silliness he would have a right to mock at us he laughed heartily with her and after a supper 
they went to bed during the night his wife had a dream she dreamed that a ship set off for the polar seas on an expedition in which she was not sufficiently interested to, to find out its reason the ship departed with her on board for a time she was concerned with baggage and with counting and going over the various articles she had brought against the arctic weather she had thick woolen stockings she had skin boots all hairy inside all pliable and wrinkled without she had a great skin cap shaped like a helmet and fitting down in a cape over the shoulders she had even and it did not astonish her a pair of very baggy fur trousers she had a sleeping sack she had an enormous quantity of things and everybody in the expedition was equipped if not with the same things at least similarly these traps were an unending subject of conversation aboard and although days and weeks passed the talk of the ship hovered about and fell continually into the subject of warm clothing there came a day when the weather began to be perceptibly colder so cold indeed that she was tempted to draw on these wonderful breeches and fit her head into that most cosy hat but she did not do so for and everybody on the ship explained it to her it was necessary that she should accustom herself to the feeling of cold and she was further informed the chill which she was now feeling was nothing to the chill she would presently have to bear it seemed good advice and she decided that as long as she could bear the cold she would do so and would not put on any protective covering thus when the cold became really intense she would be to some degree ready for it and would not suffer so much but steadily and day by day it became colder and now they were in wild and whirling seas wherein great green and white icebergs were sailing by and all about the ship little hummocks of ice bobbed and surged and went under and came up and the grey water slashed and hissed against and on top of these small hillocks her hands were so chilly that she had to put them under her armpits to keep any warmth in them and her feet were in a worse condition they had begun to pain her so she decided that on the next day she would put on her winter equipment and would not mind what anybody said to the contrary it is cold enough said she for my arctic trousers and my warm soft boots and my great furry gloves i will put them on in the morning for it was then almost night and she meant to go to bed at once she did go to bed and lay there quite cold and miserable in the morning she was yet colder and immediately on rising she looked about for the winter clothing which she had laid ready by the side of her bunk the night before but she could not find them she was forced to dress in her usual rather thin clothes and having done so she went on deck when she got to the side of the vessel she found that the world about her was changed the sea had disappeared far as the eye could go was a level plain of ice not white but grey and over it there lowered a sky grey as itself and of almost the same shade across this waste there blew a bitter and piercing wind so that her ears tingled and stung no one was moving on the ship and the dead silence which brooded on the snow lay heavy and almost solid on the vessel she ran to the other side and found that the whole ship's company had landed and were staring at her from a little distance of the land and these people were as silent as the frozen air as the frozen ship they stared at her and made no move and made no sound she noticed that they were all dressed in their winter furs and while she stood ice began to creep into her veins one of the ship's company suddenly strode forward a few paces and held up a bundle in his mittened hand she saw the bundle contained her clothes her broad furry trousers her great cosy helmet and gloves to get from the ship to the ice was painful but not difficult for a rope ladder was hanging against the side and down this she went 
the rungs felt hard as iron for they were frozen stiff and the touch of those glassy surfaces bit into her tender hand like fire but she got to the ice and went across it towards her companions then to her dismay to her terror all these suddenly with one unexpressed accord turned and began to run swiftly away from her and she with a heart that could scarcely beat took after them every few paces she fell for her shoes could not grip on the ice and each time she fell those monsters stood and turned and watched her and the man who had her clothes waved the bundle at her and danced grotesquely silently she continued running sliding falling picking herself up until her breath went and she came to a halt unable to move a limb further and scarcely able to breathe and this time they did not stay to look at her they continued running but now with greater and greater speed and she saw them become black specks away on the white distance and she saw them disappear and there was nothing left where she stared but the long white miles and the terrible silence and the cold how cold it was and with that there rose again a little wind keen as a razor which whipped into her face swirled about her ankles like a whip and stabbed under her armpits like a dagger i am cold she murmured she looked backwards when she had come but the ship was no longer in sight and she could not remember in what direction it lay then she began to run in any direction indeed she ran in every direction to find the ship for when she had taken an hundred steps in one way she thought frantically this is not the way and at once she began to run on the opposite road but run as she might she could not get warm it was colder she got and then she slipped again and went sliding down a hollow faster and faster she came to the brink of a cleft and swished over this and down into a hole of ice and there she lay i shall die she said i shall fall asleep here and die then she awoke she opened her eyes directly on the window and saw the dawn struggling with the darkness a film of grayish light which framed the window but did not lift the obscurity of the room and she lay for a second smiling to herself at her grotesque dream and thanking god that it had only been a dream the next second she felt that she was cold she pulled the clothes more tightly about her and she spoke to her husband how miserably cold it is she said she turned over in the bed and lay against him for warmth and then she found that the atrocious cold came from him that it was he she leapt out of bed with a scream switched on the light and bent over him he was stone dead he was stone cold and she stood by him shivering and whimpering End of desire by james stevens